I'm Neil Anderson, head of school at Trinity Classical School in Houston, Texas. We are a pre-K through 12 Christ-centered classical and collaborative school, and we are just thrilled with the educational model that the Lord has led us into, and we want to share about it. Classical education is um, historically the pursuit of the several li seven liberal arts, the seven pathways, the seven roads of learning that have kind of been time tested um, that are avenues for these things I'm talking about. Avenues for the pursuit of understanding of the depth of knowledge of God and then an investigation of his world. Everything that flows out of a classical education, um, vocational training, uh, test scores, college admissions, all the things that we think education is about, those are all kind of lumped up with the ideas of the pragmatism of a, of a progressive education, which is the opposite of a classical education. It has different ends. Classical education is the pursuit of wisdom and virtue using the ancient path. <laughs> the spirit of education is um, investigating God's world, knowing God's world, understanding the laws of nature, understanding how things work together, all in an effort to best intuit who He is and how we can live this life. That's wisdom and virtue. Wisdom is knowing God, and then the outplaying of wisdom is virtue, how we use that knowledge to figure out how to live. As they begin to further intuit who God is, the makeup of His world, our desire, our hope is that from depth of learning, they will intuit depth of God, and in the intuition of the depth of God, and an, an increasing of all would happen. That there would be, so when I say more potent worship, what we're trying to do is use education as kind of, of, of a pathway of discipleship whereby students further see the grandeur of God and their worship magnifies because they start to ask the deeper version of the question, what must he be like? As you see the landscape unfold, as you study the human body, or you study the environment, or you study the liter literary analysis, or some of the complexities of the higher math, what should emerge for Christians in a classical education arena is um, an increasing sense of awe of the infinite complexity of God, <laughs> mixed in with the fact that He's become personal with us, wants relationship with us, and um, we kind of continue in life that way. So our ultimate end at Trinity Classical School and a lot of classical education communities um, is more potent worship. We want students to have a big view of God and for that to be transformative in their life and discipleship. The education at our school is oriented around something we call the trivium. This is a word that is from the medieval period, uh, trivium, Latin for three ways, but was popularized in Dorothy Sayers' essay, The Lost Tools of Learning, which is an essay that was really catalytic in the, the, the new movement of classical schools in the United States of America. Um, we, we have all kind of rallied around some of her ideas in that article where she talks about the, the stages of a child's learning, the, the grammar stage, the logic stage, and the rhetoric stage. These are three of the seven liberal arts, but when you think of about them as stages of learning, this is how that goes. The grammar school phase, we're trying to teach with the grain of where a student is naturally at. So in the grammar school years, roughly pre-K through fourth or fifth grade, our, our, our pedagogy is the way that we instruct and the tools we're trying to give students um, are all oriented around the absorption of objective content. Um, so uh, the grammar of things, if you will. So the grammar of history is the basic data and facts of history. And our educational initiative in those years is just really to get them the facts, to get them the data, and to have them memorize it as much as possible. So we use uh, chanting and singing and sound offs, and these are different pedagogies, different ways that we instruct in the classroom to help them absorb that content best.
So we're not really pressing in that first phase for depth of understanding. That's not really where they're at in their progression. We just want them to absorb the basic data of life. That's what they like to do. That's what they're good at. And we're trying to prepare them for this next phase, the logic phase, which is where we do go deeper. We, we, we insist that they ask the question why on all things. It's, 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 it's our main pedagogy, even as instructors, is to ask the students why. Why, why do you know what you, what you know? Why, why, why does what you think you know, why, why is it true? Or why do you think it's true? How do you know that? Uh, and to give account for that, we teach them formal logic in this phase. If you go back to the example of history, we've departed from just the basic data and history, data and places of history, and we're moving into the whys of history. How did civilizations form? Um, what, 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 why, did, why did different governmental structures form? Why did wars happen? Who won and why? What was the outplaying? So on and so forth. This is the, this is the nature of that second phase of learning, the logic phase. And then the final, the final phase in the trivium structure is what we typically understood as, as high school, ninth through 12th grade, roughly. And in ninth through 12th grade, um, this is a big missing piece we feel like in public education. The rhetoric phase is the phase where we want students to be able to give an account for what they know and to synthesize the grammar of what they know and the logic of what they know and to develop arguments to be able to espouse ideas and maybe most importantly to speak with conviction, to actually believe something, maybe to be passionate about something and to figure out how to articulate that. So when we put all the, these all together, we feel like we have a, a, a robust pedagogy for the learning process. Poetry is the art of language and we want our students to tap into that because language is what God used to create the world and he's given us language to be sub creators these are kind of ideas of Tolkien and ideas of Lewis where and ideas that can make the whole project of education really come to life for our students so in kindergarten when they memorize their first poem ooey gooey was a worm a mighty worm was he he stepped upon the railroad tracks the train he did not see ooey gooey all of a sudden words become fun they have life they're not trapped in a textbook there's something that we can use to create laughter to create beautiful pictures um, so we want our students to memorize the great poems of 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 history that's something that people have always done that we just don't do anymore we also want them to use the, the study of poetry to inform their language so the more they recite and practice and regurgitate beautiful language, the more propensity they have to use beautiful language in their writing, in their speaking. So rather than just teaching them vocabulary and how to use words, why don't we have them memorize beautiful poems where they can have these poems in them and that poem can affect their language and that those poems can affect how they think about um, the arts. A collaborative education affords an opportunity for uh, the best of both worlds. Um, moms and dads get that focused time at home where they're actually walking their children through the curriculum. They're instructing them in things. They're not just doing worksheets at home. They're, they're involved in training and raising up and teaching their own children. And all that comes with that, both the beautiful side of it and the difficult side of it. Um, it comes with kind of fruitful, um, kind of poetic moments of, uh, of the beauty of a homeschool education when you, it's a beautiful day outside and you have a blanket spread out on the grass and you're eating pancakes while you're studying grammar. Um, to the other end of the spectrum, which is pulling your ha hair out while you're trying to get laundry done and home educate your children and all the other things that happen in life. But on the other side of it is you have these few days a week, couple days a week, where your children are going to school, they're dressing up in their uniform, they're learning from other authority figures, they're socializing with other students, and um, this is where we get the best of both worlds effect. Uh, many of us cannot get completely comfortable with full-time homeschooling, nor are we completely comfortable with students going to be with other educators, frankly, for, for more time each week than they're with us. So collaborative education provides this opportunity to get both of those in one and to kind of um, keep those things hand in hand all the way through your, your, your children's pre-K through 12 education.
There's a lot of flexibility to the model. That's something that we wanted initially, that um, families would have more time as a family uh, because of the way the schedule works. There's even things like, since in the lower school, there's not a formal education day on Fridays, that happens in fifth grade and above. Um, prior to that, there's some flexibility for some long weekends. Even the fact that Friday is a homeschool day and Thursday is a homeschool day pre creates an opportunity for families to, to, to use the schedule to serve their family best. Families are finding different ways to even supplement this and make it more tailored to what they're trying to get out of an education with their particular family. There's also opportunities at Trinity for leadership development. We don't do a student council, but we do something called the house system. A lot of classical schools are doing this. It's something that's kind of revived from the British school system. And we divide each seventh grade and up. Students are placed in one of four houses. We've named our houses after great, uh, great scientists, great Christian scientists. So we have the house of Pascal, the house of Carver, the house of Maxwell, and the house of Kepler and students fly those house colors. They get a tire scarf wearing those colors and they're inducted to that house in seventh grade. And so we have these houses that have a leadership structure. There's four house heads, different offices that are elected each year. And there's also an opportunity to, to compete for the house cup annually where um, it's an annual competition where students um, compete for the, the ultimate prize at the end of the year um, based off of different things that they've done throughout the year, service projects, um, different things that they've done to kind of help the school community flourish, um, uh, all sorts of ways that they're able to earn points throughout the year to compete for the House Cup. So that's been a neat thing for our students. Um, for us to be authentic as a Christian school means for us to be a worshiping community, for us to be filled with people who actually love the Lord, believe the scriptures, and are pursuing education as an act of worship. So we start on that level with our parents um, that we admit into the school and with our staff that we're looking to employ at the school and all of us as a community of, of, of adults and disciple makers are trying to invest in students towards that end. There's a lot of practical outplayings of that. We start every day with morning assembly, we call it. It's a form of chapel where students are singing hymns, memorizing scripture, involved in kind of a call and response of basic Bible truths. But still, the point of even that is that those of us as adults who are leading that, it is, it's about worship. When Trinity Classical School started just about 10 years ago, our vision at the time was just to start a uh, Christ-centered classical and collaborative school here in Houston, that would be a great school. And as time has passed, the Lord has been favorable with our school by way of resources. He's grown the school immensely. And increasingly, we're looking outward to help other schools start like Trinity Classical School. As various groups from around the country seek us out, looking to start something like Trinity Classical School in their area of town or their area of the country, uh, we feel called to help with that. So we have recently been establishing the Trinity Network, which is a network of schools looking to uh, yoke together, to be colleagues together. Um, Trinity is desiring to share from our resources to help those schools get started. And over time, what we'd like to see happen is a strong network of schools that identify as Christ-centered, classical, and collaborative, and are looking to see that mission fulfilled in their area of town or their area of the country.